Hi, I'm Terrence McNally here at Bioneers 2011, and with me right now is Hai Vo. Hi. Hey. Um, and uh, Hai was a community outreach and research fellow with the California Food and Justice Coalition, and you can learn more about that organization at cafoodjustice.org. He currently coordinates a fellowship program with Live Real, a national initiative uniting youth and communities for food system that respects people and planet. He's a 2009 recipient of the Earth Island Institute's Brower Youth Award for his efforts with the Real Food Challenge. Um, whenever anyone wins a youth award, it means they made some sort of change or took something on, you know, before most of us. What, what was your path to the work you did for that award? Sure. Your personal path. Sure, sure. So I grew up in Southern California, in Orange County, um, after, my, after I was born in Iowa. Oh, my, my parents. See, I, knew, I took you for an Iowa. The Midwestern? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my parents and my brother, they immigrated um, from Vietnam at the end of 86, and I was born in Iowa, and soon moved to Southern California in Orange County. And I, uh, I grew up in Orange County, and I also grew up with uh, the industrial food system. Uh, I come from an immigrant background, and so food access and affordability um, were, ch were challenging things. In, your, in the neighborhoods in which you grew up? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so um, my parents always knew how to prepare foods, and they knew that um, what they could afford wasn't the best food, but they knew what to do with them. So my mom would always like wash the vegetables, because she knew. Right, so uh, the pesticides. Yeah, to right, right. That. And so um, I grew up with Vietnamese food, but I also grew up loving processed school lunches. I loved um, going to my friends' houses and eating cheap food. So are you saying that even that in your own house, it, it wasn't as much an industrial diet as wherever, wherever else you could grab it? Um, I wouldn't say that it was isolated. My parents, um, they did buy from the industrial food sure. system, um, but my parents were more conscious about how they were preparing the foods. Mm -hmm. um, and it crept, it crept up on me. Yeah. So uh, when I was 18, I was 250 pounds. Which with, is, which is I, I mean, I'd read it before we, we, we did this, but it's uh, sort of hard to imagine looking at you now, 250 yeah, pounds. Yeah, yeah, and I had... Um, and that, I, crept, that crept up on you too, right? Oh yeah, I've always been a husky child. Like husky growing up. Um, it, I was always different from my family. Uh -huh. uh, I was much taller but much huskier. And um, yeah, when I was 18, 250 pounds with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, um, Emotionally distraught, just sure. just unstable, and uh, I visited my family, our family doctor, and after the blood work was done, the doctor told me that if I continued to live and eat the way that I did, uh, I would live to be thirty. Wow. And at eighteen, was that? I mean, was that enough? Was that? Was oh, you, oh yeah. Was like, that the thing that you just the light bulb went on? Oh yeah. I, I, I mean, I didn't. It you felt, thought, hey, I'm a little heavy. Uh, yeah, and, and, and there was nothing that I could do. I don't know. I, I, could, I needed to do something. I knew I needed to do something. And so that was the, that was the, the moment for me, the climax sure. uh, for me. Well, so you're 18. You're not living a crazy life, but you've suddenly found you have a crazy result. And you decide you're going to change. What did you do next? How did you meander that yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I mean it was a it's still a personal journey for me uh, food and and health um, for me and it was realizing what I was putting into my body and how my body was behaving so realizing that if I took out soda I'd be less nervous or anxious I could concentrate you, in school now, what I'm gonna ask you because this is so personal did you get great advice from anyone, or did you just kind of go, I wonder about soda? I mean, was it like your own, did you just kind of have sort of intuitions that you acted on? 
Yeah, I, I haven't been able to describe it yet. <laughs> well, let's do it. But I, it's, um, I've always had this very personal intuition about my body and how it interacts with the so, environment. So it wasn't that you went and got a book that told you what to do. Mm -mm. You said uh, no. you had a sense that soda might be a culprit. Right. And so you made a change and you found a difference. Yeah, I, ma I made a change. It was soda first, and then I realized my activity level. So I started running, and I started exercising, and I started moving my body, and I started um, had a mentally challenging myself through school and 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 introducing myself to new networks and new campaigns and new, new ideas. Now, no, what you just said is interesting to me. In other words, the stimulus was you were overweight and had a dangerous prognosis, right? But it turns out what you're saying is you changed your mental approach to your life as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so, I had to. So it wasn't just that you were eating poorly or exercising not enough. You also discovered that you weren't engaged enough in your life? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was, like I said, it was, I was emotionally, dis I felt emotionally disabled. Wow. Um, and my relationships changed 180 once I uh, started becoming more awake to what I was eating, what I was putting into my body, um, and started noticing that my relationships uh, started to change. Wow. Um, that my inner culture and my dynamics with other people were becoming more positive. Um, I was doing much better in school. Interesting. And so it was not only a physical transformation, but it was a very mental transformation. Wow. Um, and I started noticing how that personal instinct of mine um, was not just with food, but it was also what was, what was in the air, what I was drinking, how I was interacting in certain spaces, hmm. that I was feeling better outside than inside. Interesting. Uh, and so it brought me into kind of the environmental movements, mm -hmm. brought me into um, health movements, brought me into food movements. Um, How long was the process? You weigh, you said you lost 100 pounds. Um, is that, you're, you're at like 150 now? Uh, yeah, 120, or 100, you lost 110. 100, yeah. You lost 110 yeah. in, over what period of time? Um, it was in three years. Okay, so yeah. it wasn't like, it, that doesn't sound like something that you know, where those people do these crash things that right. make them worse off. Right. I wanted, um, I knew for me personal sustainability was something really important. And so um, I took it one, one day at a time, one run at a time. And, I, and, I, and once, I started, once I started going to college was when I was being introduced to people who were looking into personal transformation, also looking into the politics around change, social change and also um, being introduced to, to people who, especially young people, who were excited for change. Uh -huh. And so um, I started connecting with this group called the Real Food Challenge, um, and they wanted to increase real food on college campuses. And is this a national movement? Yeah, yeah, it's a national movement. Uh, right now, uh, over 400 colleges in the US, they, purchase 2% real food on average. Yeah, 2%. What's the goal? So the goal is 20% by 2020. And define for people real food. Sure, so real food is food that is ecologically sound. It's based in the community of uh, the institution. It is humane, and it's fair to people who eat it, fair to farmers, fair to people who produce the food. Interesting. Do you know Oren Hesterman's book, Fair Food? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's awesome. Yeah. I like him a lot. Yeah, I, 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 lot. I, I interviewed him recently. And, oh, cool. And, and it was his definition, that's why I asked, because your definition was so similar, mm -hmm. that people don't often make all those connections, mm -hmm. that it's local, it's ethical, it's fair. It's, and, right. and it's like you go, oh, we, you know, if we were going to design a food system, if right. we were awake and aware and it wasn't all about money, it's what we designed. It's what, what, it's what it would be. Now, you, you won the award not for losing weight, but for what you did right. at your campus and so on. So what, what, did you, what were you able to pull off at UC Irvine? Right, so, the, so part of that personal transformation was also this societal transformation. Sure. And so I worked with um, students at the University of California, Irvine, and um, the University of California to pass sustainable food policy 
in the UC system. Now the UC so system imagine, is massive. I would yeah. imagine, is it the biggest state system? I would assume it is. Um, I'm not sure. I know it's, um, the UC system comprises of 10 campuses, um, hospitals, and vendor affiliates. Do you know the population? Oh, I think it's... You don't have to, but I mean... I think mean, it's 35 million. No, that's the population of the state. Oh. I meant the UC system. Oh, How many UC, people I'm we're talking sure, about? But we're talking about a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of folks. And so so you've won. They've they've pledged? Yeah, so, we, so there were a few things that were being done. One was research. So I was doing an audit of our dining halls on campus and figuring out what percentage real food. At UC Irvine. At UC Irvine. Mm -hmm. So we found out that... UCI dining halls purchase 10% real food. Oh. And then the second part was education. So figuring out, okay, now we understand the percentage. Now do students, do faculty members, do community members know about that? And so we did a, uh, an educational series where we brought in 500 community members oh, um, to learn about that. And then finally was the policy. Right. So organizing students and community members to have the UC system sign on to the Real Food Challenge policy. So um, within nine years, the UC uh, system has to purchase 20% real food. Um, and that's a big feat. There, up, it up is until, a big feat. I mean, up until then, the UC system has had passed um, lead sustainability policy, transportation. So for people who don't know, lead is how they build their buildings. Right, right. It's transportation. It's, is okay how what their like, fleets are like so how, right how yeah. how people move. but they hadn't done anything about food yeah and and it hadn't that had wouldn't have started if it weren't for students starting in 2004 so UC students were already working to get policy in place in the UC system and so in 2008 and 2009 I was part of that working group um, to pass that policy and so what are, you've been out of school how many years now? For two years. For two years. Yeah. And what are you, I mean, one, I, I, I can obviously tell from uh, the way you tell the story that, you know, that obviously this is a journey that continues, but you found that you became more engaged, more aware, more active, all those things. I mean, you sense like you changed your entire relationship to, you know, to what, what are you working on these days? So since I finished school, I realized that there, I realized, and there were youth and, and adults who work with youth who realized that there are youth and communities out there who are more impacted by the food system than the privilege of a college institution. So, sure. And so um, it resonated with me because I come from an immigrant right. background and family. And so I've been working on this new initiative to change food culture and policy that respect ourselves, um, each other, and the earth, um, targeting and working with communities um, that are most impacted by our, our industrial food system. And so right now I'm in the process of helping, um, helping develop the communication and community organizing skills of youth leaders uh, who are working on food justice in their communities. So this is, um, I mean, no longer restricted to college campuses, but youth working right. in where they live. Um, for people who don't know, um, do, are, do you know when the Farm Bill is next up in Congress? The Farm Bill is coming up to, for reauthorization next year in 2012. 2012. Right. And uh, many, I mean, the Farm Bill for m m the last 50 years or so has basically been one of those bills that uh, if you're in Iowa or, you know, even certain parts of California and so on, it's something you care about a great deal because you're agribusiness. Mm -hmm. But other legislators basically would trade their votes, mm -hmm. right? In other words, if you'll do what I want on something else, you, of course I'll vote for your farm bill. So the farm bill was something which I think most people just ignored. Now, the last farm bill got a lot of attention, but it still wasn't very good. What's What's the... What's the prospects for some sort of really positive change in the next farm bill? I think the prospects are coming out of alternative agriculture groups. I think the prospects are coming out of youth and communities that are the most impact, impacted by the, monocult like the monolith of oh, yeah. our commodity crops and declaring their rights. 
So uh, the how politics has run around the farm bill that can't that can't continue. On. And 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 you feel like there's enough attention, awareness, and and activism that this will be a different case this time around. Um, our our feeling is that if it's if we're not hearing if we we don't hear that that's happening, we're going to be the ones to do that. Well, that's that's so, exciting. So that's exciting. you know there are groups out there that are that are really key allies um, in changing how money is used for the farm bill, and and money being used for conservation programs, for diversified farming, for crop insurance, for uh, farmers of color, um, and increasing food access and food affordability uh, at farmers markets, at for food enterprise, for community food projects. And I think what's really cool is that young people are starting to declare their rights um, as this generation who will inherit um, these policies yeah. um, that are in place. And so why call it a farm bill when there's when it could be a food bill, yeah. and it should be a food bill. Right. And I think what's really interesting is that there's such an emerging network of young people who are starting to recognize um, that their voice matters, that their, their stories matter. Um, and it could, it could and it will play, play in the political spectrum. That's exciting. That's very exciting. I'm, I'm excited for the, the Youth Food Bill of Rights. Um, I like that. that, is, was that, is, that is that, wait, that the Youth Food Bill of Rights is a declaration of a number of youth around the country? Yeah, 180 youth uh, met in Philadelphia uh, at the Rooted in Community Conference. And they signed and declared a Youth Food Bill of Rights that had principles like more farmers markets than corner liquor stores. Um, and uh, declared, this ri declared these rights uh, for the food and the life that we want to see in the Farm Bill. Um, and nothing like that has ever happened no, before. No, definitely not. So wanting to work with the youth who are part of, um, who are in states where there are representatives um, that are part of the U.S. Senate and House Ag, Ag Committees um, to start building those relationships um, and and change the, those paradigms in the farm bill. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you for the work you're doing. And, oh, thank you. And and and, and you know, I mean, let's let's hope. I, I really hope that this farm bill is the one that changes the way yeah. business as usual is yeah. over. I do. Thank you. And I and I feel like it is a continuing process. Yeah. So 2017, yeah. 2022. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much. Cool.